Okay, I think I'll get started. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the second cell migration seminar. Um, just a few quick things before I introduce today's speaker. Um, so there were a few comments from last week about whether we could increase our Zoom capacity. Uh, we are working on it, um, but it requires money, which we don't have at the moment. So that's something we're working on. Um, if you have expressed an interest to give a talk, please send us an abstract um, to the email that's down there on the bottom right, so migration seminars at gmail.com. Uh, some of our emails are getting lost through spam filters and so on because there are so many people registered. Um, but please just send us an abstract anyway. Um, we have set up a Slack channel, which we will send on the next round of emails, and it's posted also on our Twitter. So um, if we had loads and lots, lots and lots of questions that we couldn't get through last week. Um, so if discussion goes on for excess time as well, um, we can continue that on, on the Slack channel rather than um, on Zoom, because we don't want to take up too much time on here. Uh, so that's posted on our Twitter, and we'll also send it in the email around. And then the final thing is just a reminder about how you can ask questions. So um, if you are on YouTube Live, you should be able to see a chat box uh, that you can write questions in. In that case, we'll read out on your behalf. Um, and if you are on Zoom, you can do the same thing. Um, write a question in the chat, and I'll read it out on your behalf. But what worked really well last week is if you want to just write the word question or the letter Q in the chat, um, I can call you and then you can turn on your microphone and camera uh, and you can ask the question yourself um, rather than it's just ask, us asking all the questions for you. Um, so that worked really well. So if you are on Zoom, you please do um, ask the question yourself if you want to. Um, that's all I have to say. So uh, I'll introduce today's speaker, which is Robert Insor, who's professor of Mathematical and Computational Cell Biology at the University of Glasgow and at the Beetson Institute. Uh, Robert's lab combines experimental and computational work to understand cell migration and chemotaxis using various systems, including cancer cells and dictyostelium. And today he's going to be talking about uh, reverse chemotaxis. So thanks a lot, Robert, for doing this. So if you want to just share and unmute, and we'll all leave. Uh, Robert, you're still muted, just so you know. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks. I will get to the end of the Zoom troubles. All right. Are we working, Adam? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear and we can see your black screen. Good. Okay, um, thanks. If you want to switch me to um, uh, the frame I can see at the moment, we can see you rather than me on the on the top right frame. Uh, so, so everyone is only able to see you, but because you're the presenter, you'll just see the last person that spoke. Okay, that's excellent. But everyone can see you. Smashing. Okay. Um, 
So uh, I don't therefore know if I'm in the right um, place in the frame, which is, hang on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do something about, well, never mind. Um, I don't know if I'm in the right place in the frame, so someone shout at me if, uh, if I'm not. So- hey, um, Rob, Rob, yes. I think um, there's a button uh, that says speaker view in the upper right-hand corner. If you click that, uh, I think yeah, you should just your- It's- Well, we'll let you know if, uh, if it's if it's a problem, but we can all see you okay. Cool speaker view, isn't that one? It's a Zoom setting. Okay. View. Oh, it's a Zoom setting. Well, never mind. Right. Um, you just you just tell me if anything's wrong. Um, uh, so, um, thank you all for coming. Amazing to see the um, the take up of this um, just goes to show that uh, scientists are very good of making something good out of uh, a very bad scenario. Um, I want to talk about all sorts of things. I'm going to end with negative chemotaxis, um, but I'm going to get there by a sort of twisted route, which is appropriate for a talk on chemotaxis. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about gradients and how cells generate them, and I'm going to talk about mazes, uh, and I'm going to show how that leads on to negative chemotaxis. Um, because it's really hard on Zoom to give thanks to people afterwards, I'm going to thank them first. Um, this story started with, with um, Andy Martin, who's shown there, receiving a prize for his PhD. Um, uh, John McKenzie has consistently helped with the math, Michele with the engineering, uh, and a lot of the work you'll see today has been done by Luke and, and Adam uh, down at the bottom, and it's been tremendous fun. So um, I, hope, I hope you enjoy it too. Okay, and all these people, because there's, um, uh, there's no such thing as science in a vacuum, uh, all these people have contributed no end. The sad name in this is Mike Wakelin, who died of COVID fairly early in the epidemic and was a great um, help in all of this, and we miss him. Okay, um, everyone, but everyone who is watching this knows this movie um, of a neutrophil chasing a bacterium. And um, it has shown us the kind of uh, the, the, the standard explanation of chemotaxis and the introduction that shows people what the problem is. But the thing that amazes me most always about this movie uh, is the amount of information, how perfectly the neutrophil knows exactly spatially where that bacterium is and how actually extremely improbable it is that the neutrophil can get that much information. And then you think that this is actually really a very simple um, uh, issue. It's only one neutrophil, it's only one bacterium. It hasn't got anything complicated to understand. And when you muse on that, you realize what a totally serious, complicated biological problem understanding chemotaxis is. But the real problem is about information. Where does all that information come from? And that's what this section of my lab has been most interested in this last 10 years, where does biological information arise from? Um, if you think about a much more complicated situation, like the uh, melanoblasts in an embryonic uh, mouse, you can see that there is the arm of a mouse embryo. Uh, and this here is a movie of the melanoblasts populating the arm during melanogenesis, during embryogenesis. And they move down that arm uh, by chemotaxis. Um, uh, but the question is, how do they know where to go down that arm? Where is the information? Is there a little signal at the end of that pinky right there saying, come this way, pigment cells? Of course there isn't. That's ridiculous. Um, but actually, almost any other narrative about where the information to attract the melanoblasts comes from uh, reaches a similar problem. Where does the information come from? We don't know. We know a certain amount about how the cells execute the chemotaxis, um, but we don't know how they know where to go. Um, and biologists, when they are trying to understand a problem like um, chemotaxis, let's call chemotaxis X in this diagram, we always tend to draw pathway diagrams and look what goes upstream and what goes downstream. So if X is one of these cells chemotaxing, you might say downstream was the actin cytoskeleton or the receptors or something. 
and he might say upstream was some other cell that was making the chemoattractant. But the trouble is all this pathway does, it doesn't tell you any information, all this pathway does is it boots the ball up the field. And we're biologists, we don't want to spend all our time booting balls up and down fields. We want to understand why something happens. We want to understand why an embryo organizes the way an embryo organizes. We don't want to draw these long pathways that go from bit to bit. Because, well, for one thing, um, there's no information in it. All this pathway says is that whatever happens to chemotaxis is exactly the same thing as what happens upstream and downstream. There's nothing interesting there. I don't believe that's true, but that's what this pathway diagram says. And the other thing is this, this, this pathway gives you a, an, an um, impression that it's telling you something about mechanism. But again, all it's doing is booting the ball up and down the field. It's not saying um, the melanoblasts came attacks because of something. It's saying somebody else did it. Some other cell made the signal or something else did it. And you never actually discover anything. What we want to discover is the information. We want to discover why the cells go and where the information comes to tell those cells where they want to go in the embryo, during the nerves, or when there's an infection, whenever cells need to chemotax in vivo. Now, um, it's a slightly twisted story, but there's lots of different ways of, of telling it. Um, here's a good one that I like. Um, we were studying melanoma. And melanoma is a nasty, nasty cancer. And it's a nasty cancer because it always spreads. You tend not to see patients with big melanomas because the melanoma has spread and killed the patient before it has the chance to be big. And actually, um, if you look uh, at a melanoma, you can, you can see that it's spreading just by examining it because you presume that somewhere in the middle there, was a cell that became cancerous, gained sufficient mut mutations to start growing. And if these cells were just moving randomly, then you would expect the melanoma to be a Gaussian shape with a load of cancer cells right in the middle there and decreasingly many as you go out. But actually you don't see a Gaussian shape. You see this big spread out ring with raggedy edges uh, and an awful lot of, of, of extra stuff at the edges. Uh, and our interpretation of that is that these cells know uh, and they know to spread outwards. They know to spread from the middle where the tumor is now outwards into the patient. And that's why it's such a horrible cancer because it spreads outwards. But you see, you always come to this problem. How does a melanoma know where is outwards and where is inwards? There must be some information. A cell that's in the middle of a tumor doesn't know where it's out unless you tell it. Um, and so the um, booting the football up the field answer is it's chemotaxis. And it certainly is chemotaxis. If you take melanoma cells uh, and put them in a chemotaxis chamber and you give them serum on the right where I've written high and you just put cells where there's no serum when I put low and you watch what happens, they're absolutely extraordinarily directed. They're really very, very scarily directed. And they're always moving towards whatever attractants are in serum. Serum is, is the richest possible mix of, of stuff. Um, stuff that's attractive and stuff that's stimulating immune cells and stuff that's stimulating growth. But something in there is making these melanoma cells chemotax like mad. So the question again is, if these melanoma cells are spreading by chemotaxis, what is the gradient and why is it there? In other words, where does the information come from to spread these melanoma cells outwards? Or if you want to put it another way, what business does your body have making chemotactic gradients in order for tumors to spread and kill you? Um, put that way, it's ridiculous. But wherever you see chemotaxis happening in vivo, you always want to ask the same question, who is creating this gradient and why is it there? Um, and that's something we don't always know. So in the case of melanoma, um, we found out the answer close to 10 years ago now, amazing how time flies. And that is that actually you don't need a gradient. If you put serum on the right as you did before, but you also put serum on the left, 
So these cells are in a chemotaxis chamber with no gradient at all, high serum anywhere, but the cells are in the left and you watch what happens. You find out it's exactly the same. The gradient that we apply to these cells is irrelevant. The cells don't need a gradient to spread by chemotaxis. Uh, where does the gradient come from in that case? Um, the answer is the cells themselves are breaking down the chemoattractant. So where there are cells, there on the left, there's no chemoattractant. And there on the right, where there are no cells, there is chemoattractant. So wherever the cells are, they create a gradient of chemoattractant around themselves. Um, in the case of our melanoma cells, the chemoattractant turns out to be LPA, lysophosphatidic acid, uh, and we can measure the cells breaking down the LPA. And if you have a dense culture of cells, shown there in pink, they break down all of the LPA and the serum you give them within a day or so. Um, so anyone who worked on cultured melanoma cells, and probably a whole lot of cultured other cells too, should be thinking. Um, uh, actually, when you first feed the cells, they're at time zero, you're giving them a monstrous dose of a mitogen and a chemoattractant, um, but 24 hours later, they're seeing something completely different. Anyhow, um, that's a side issue. The point is, the melanoma cells break down the attractant uh, and create their own gradient. So we call that self-generated gradients, um, and uh, quite a lot of my lab have been studying this for quite a lot of years now. Um, here's a model that Luke Tweedy made years ago, showing what a self-generated gradient looks like. So the first thing you see is initially there's no gradient. The attractant is shown in red. And we've put the cells there on the left. And then if you run the simulation, um, you see three things. The first thing you see is that the cells make the gradient. Then the cells follow the gradient then the gradient moves. So the whole thing is a feedback loop. The second thing you see is that the cells are going quite a way long, quite a long way behind um, the peak of the gradient. And that turns out to be because they're saturated in the front, they can't see anything. And the third thing is they lose quite, they leave quite a lot of cells behind. And there's quite a lot of math and modeling um, needed to explain that. But when push comes to shove, the answer is um, you always have exactly enough cells in that wave of cells moving through the medium to break down all of the attractant as it flows through. And so all those cells that are left behind aren't seeing an attractant. They aren't seeing anything at all because the wave has got there. And these, these principles turn out to be fairly universal. Lots of attractant. You don't need the cells to start in a gradient. As you saw from my earlier movie, if you give the cells a gradient, that's fine, but they don't need it because they can make it themselves. And the information about where the gradient is comes from the cells themselves through a feedback mechanism with the environment. The whole thing, it's marvelous. It's extremely dynamic. It's extremely complicated. Um, you can't begin to um, just uh, shoot from the hip and uh, imagine what you think is happening. Uh, quite a lot of people I discuss this with do, but they say if the cells are breaking down the um, attractant, how can there be any gradient? How can the cells move? But the answer is when you analyze the dynamics like this, you can see the cells can both break down attractant and make a gradient. Um, and it's counterintuitive. And it's really interesting. So what is presumably happening with those monoblasts in mouse development is there is presumably a chemoattractant in the arm. Uh, and the monoblasts are making a gradient of it. So those ones in the front that are shown in red are directed because they're sitting in a gradient. And it turns out that the ones behind the front, which are shown there with their tracks in yellow, aren't directed at all, they're just migrating round and round. So what the mouse limb does really supports quite well this, this idea um, of a self-generated gradient 
that tells make as they go, uh, uh, which drives them to explore places where they haven't been yet. And this is absolute mathematical biology, it's paradise. Um, you've got instabilities, you've got positive feedback, you've got negative feedback. The results will be completely counterintuitive unless you go and model them and look at some equations. Um, so you have to use models and equations rather than insight. Um, you have some interesting and complicated emergent properties, uh, which are wonderful to study. And it's also a wet biologist's paradise, because look, I've shown you the models, but here are some real cells, in this case, dictyostelium, doing exactly the same thing that we showed in the model, going in a wave. So that's how we got here. It turned out when I was giving a talk about this to a microbiology meeting, um, that this had all been seen before, years ago, in 1966, look, down the bottom, when I was about one. Uh, it turned out that Julius Adler um, in Madison um, had shown that E. coli do a similar thing. And after I gave this talk to the Microbiology Society, someone came up to me after the talk and said, did you know Julius Adler is still working, still running our lab? And this amazed me because this work was done, published when I was one, and I'm not a young scientist anymore. Um, but I ended up having a nice email conversation with him. I saw some of you were in Madison. Um, could you please, uh, when this talk is finished, go and tell Julius that he's on TV, he'll like it. Anyhow, what Julius Adler showed is that if you have a simple um, agar and you put cells in the middle of it, there, then they grow outwards in a ring, and that ring is exactly the same as the wave that I showed you the eukaryotic cells doing. And if you put them in a complex medium, they give you three concentric waves. Um, the outer one is serine, which is the best attractant, uh, and everyone inside that ring has used up all the serum. The second ring is aspartate, and everyone inside that ring has used up all the aspartate, uh, and the inner ring is threonine. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, anyhow, so we asked the question, biologically speaking, um, why use self-generated gradients? What are they good for? Uh, and I'll show you a few of the reasons, but the take home message before we get there is that take home, is that self-generated gradients um, work differently from how you expect a chemotactic gradient to work in every way. And so they let you do a whole load of different things biologically. For example, um, going to models for a bit, if we model some cells hemotaxing over one half of a millimeter, you see that in a fixed gradient, cells do really well at the beginning, but as they go along the gradient, they get slower and windier and less accurate. And that's because at the beginning of the gradient, there's some attractant at the good end of the cells, and there's no attractant at the other end. So they have nearly perfect information. But the further they get through this gradient, the more noise and complexity they get. And also the more saturated their receptors become, so the less information they're able to get out of them. Now, if you run a self-generated gradient, the gradient is very, very steep and very, very local, and the cells carry it with them. So they're much more robust and much more accurate. Becomes even clearer if you try and do a long gradient. So if you try and do a two millimeter gradient, you find the cells again start off fine, but they start getting confused. And actually, they can't do it. They can't get any further than about one millimeter while chemotaxing. Whereas the cell generated gradient doesn't care. Because the actual gradient is being carried by where the cells are, and the cells are in this wave. Um, they can go for any direction you want. I'm sorry, looking at the scale on this, it was one millimeter, not two millimeters in this model. So what this means practically is that anytime you see a chemotactic gradient happening and it's happening for a millimeter, it can't be a simple gradient. You can't have a gradient that is set up by the pinky of that embryonic mouse attracting the melanoblasts all the way from the neural crest it won't work. There must be some kind of self-generated gradient 
happening there. It's not exclusive. Um, uh, Chemotaxis can work fine on shorter gradients than that and still be a self-generated gradient. But if you see a big one, it's self-generated. So here, just to prove the point, and just because it is a wet biologist's paradise, um, arson dictyostelium uh, chemotaxing for 10 millimeters. And you see they chemotax just as well at the end of this experiment as what they did at the beginning, even though our maths tells us that they couldn't do it because our maths was built for a fixed gradient. And the gradient in this assay is actually just in that little bit there where the wave of cells is. There's no gradient anywhere else. Here's another thing that happens. Imagine that you had a fixed gradient shown there in red and that the cells shown there in blue in the other end were migrating along it and it splits and it splits in two. Um, well, it's going to be completely random for each cell, whether it goes to the left or to the right. I mean, the top or the bottom in this one. Uh, so as the cells skim attacks, um, the gradient is identical in the two halves of the maze um, and um, it will be completely random and you will get a distribution of cells going to the top and a distribution of cells going to the bottom. Now look at a model of a self-generated gradient. If one cell too many goes to the top path, then it eats more of the attractant. It breaks down more of the attractant. So the gradient going into the top part is shallower. So the next cell is more likely to go downwards. With loads of cells, like we've shown here, it doesn't matter much. With few cells or with a lot of branches, it really does make a difference. And the self-generated gradient is much more robust. And now you start seeing some fun. We can start playing with this. Now we've got models and they work and we know they work because we've checked the biology and it's similar. Saying you connect the bottom channel to a source of chemoattractant, but the top channel in this split uh, path is not connected to a channel of attractant. Now what happens is that the cells use up the top one a bit faster and so slightly more cells go to the bottom. And if the blind branch is a little bit shorter, then you get an even more remarkable thing, which is most of the cells know not to go in the blind branch. So they've never explored the blind branch. They can't touch anywhere on the blind branch, but they know by breaking down a chemoattractant that it's not the right way to go. So the cells are actually able to explore their environment miles ahead of what they can actually feel or perceive directly just by means of breaking down attractants. And they can tell um, that this is the blind end and that this down at the bottom is the connected end. And you can carry this on further and further. So you can turn it into a maze. And it turns out that when you build a maze with a self-directed uh, uh, chemotactic gradient in it, cells really can see around corners. Look at this model. You can see some cells in the left in a well, and you can see really quite a complex maze um, um, before you reach home here. But all pretty much the modeled cells are able to tell the right way without needing to explore the wrong end of the branch because each time they come up to this decision point, the gradient is steeper towards the good end and shallower towards the bad end. So cells really can see around corners by breaking down a chemoattractant. Now, many of you have seen some of this work before, and so you know the punchline, but many of you haven't. Um, and the punchline is, this is just a model, right? You can make a model do anything. Um, but it turns out you can't. And it turns out we used the parameters defined by this model um, to build a real maze. And what real cells do in a real maze is almost exactly the same what the model does. The model is nearly perfect. And when it turns out that the cells do something different from what's in the model, it turns out there's a little bit of biology we didn't quite understand. And if we sort out the biology, we can usually fix it. 
and the the um, the mazes are beautiful. I mean, they're really good fun. They're really cool, um, but they're a wee bit synthetic. But if you think about it, the problem that the cells in those mazes face, it's exactly the same uh, that you get throughout biology. So imagine immune cells trying to find their way between the endothelial cells and around tissues and uh, ligaments and so forth to try and find an infection somewhere in your tissues. The problem is essentially identical. And if you imagine a developing embryo, the germ cells have to come from the edge of the embryo and migrate all the way through between all the other cells in the embryo to find the gonad. And that problem is just exactly analogous to those cells trying to find uh, their way down a maze. And neural pathfinding, neural pathfinding is even more complicated uh, and even more a problem of information and how do cells find enough. But you can see the sort of approach we're taking these sorts of mazes is going to be a wonderful way of finding it, and so on and so forth. Um, if you look for a problem uh, that you can explain with chemotaxis in biology, uh, more often than not, you'll find that those mazes look exactly like the real biological problem. And when things get more complex, like this maze with more branches, the behaviors get more complex. So in this case, with lots of branches, at the first half, the cells do about 50-50. Some of them go down here to the bottom, and some of them go down to the top. But as they get further and further through the maze, they get more and more accurate. And it turns out that what was predicted by this model, when we go and build it, is exactly true. At the start, half the cells go up and half the cells go down. But once some time has passed, they all go the correct way. And the decisions get more and more accurate as the cells go through the maze. So actually, our models really are telling us exactly what the biology is going to report, which is fantastic. Now, this is a synthetic one we take that we really enjoy. Um, so one of these mazes, and I'm not going to tell you which, one of these mazes is easy. One of these mazes is hard. When I say easy and hard, I mean easy for the cells and hard for the cells. Now, uh, before I start the movies, everyone look at these two movies, please, and try and tell which one is going to be hard for the cells and which one is going to be easy for the cells. And if you have to look now, what's easy and hard for the cells is the opposite of what's easy and hard for people. What's hard for cells is when you have long branches, long straight branches. And long straight branches are hard because it takes the cells quite a long time um, to deplete all the chemoattractants out of them and thereby read what the right way is. So the right hand one, which has long complex branches, is much harder for the cells than the left hand one where there's lots of branches, but they're all little. And if you look at the decisions that the cells take as they go through these mazes, you see that in the easy ones, the cells nearly always do the right one. Whereas in the hard maze, every time the cells hit a branch, about half of them go one way and about half of them go the other. So loads of cells finish the easy maze uh, and the hard maze is much more difficult. And lo and behold, Exactly the same is true for real cells in real mazes. It's not quite as good as the model, and it's not quite as good as the model because actually it turns out that cells are even cleverer than we give them credit, and slightly more of them than we expect get their way to the end. But even so, the model is really good. So we really quite understand about the complexity of decision making that these, these cells are making, and we really um, enjoy it. Um, now, how did this lead us on to negative chemotaxis? Uh, uh, this is interesting, and this is to do with this online chat, because when I announced I was going to do an online talk on negative chemotaxis, um, Le Dupre emailed and said, I had a paper on negative chemotaxis a year or two back. And actually, Loic's paper, hello Loic, if you're on there, Loic's paper is one of the principal reasons that we started looking at negative chemotaxis. So here's the paper. And this is one of the most interesting and engrossing and cool papers I've read for years. And if you haven't read it, um, you need to go and read it now. It's wonderful. So this Malay Ingra paper shows that. 
It's a group of T cells in chemotaxis chambers. Um, and they find that big aggregates, because it's a nasty, ill-behaved um, uh, line of cells. Uh, so it likes to stick to itself more than it likes to stick to the uh, substratum. So it quite often forms these big clumps you can see in the bottom. But it turns out that clumps are really chemotactic. So if you look at these graphs on the top, more or less whatever the gradient you give them, the clumps chemotax pretty well. But the really interesting and unexplained things is that the single cells chemotax really well to a middle gradient, but they chemotax backwards to a really high gradient. They go from high to low. Now, when we saw this paper, as well as saying this is the most fantastic paper because it's conceptual and it shows things we don't understand, and um, if there's any editors or referees watching this talk, you have to accept more things that we don't understand. It stimulates more fun. It's more interesting. Um, anyhow, so we said probably what's happening here is self-generated. Why do we think it's self-generated? Um, oh, sorry, I put it. I put it in the movie. Let's look at the movie. So. Um, there is Malay Engra's et al.'s movie of cells. On the left, you see the different concentrations, um, but the right one's the best. You see the clumps moving downwards and the single cells tending to move upwards. So we um, uh, wrote to Current Biology and said we could answer this. And we'd like to publish it as a letter at the end of the paper. And what we thought we could answer went like this. It's a problem of mass. If you have a, a gradient of high concentration, then a single cell shown there in light blue can't do much about it by breaking down the attractant because it's only a single cell uh, and new attractant will diffuse in as fast as it, it gets broken down. But if you have a really big clump of cells, then it can break down a whole load of chemoattractant. And the really big clump of cells can break down such a load of chemoattractant um, that it can create a steep gradient at its front edge there and chemotax up it. Um, so we reason that probably what's going on is just mass action. Uh, and lo and behold, we modeled this with the same sorts of models we've shown you before. And lo and behold, when you look at what we expect to happen, um, uh, the model showing the attractant here shows that we really do think with real biological parameters, real measured parameters, that the clumps of cells probably can make big dents in the chemoattractant, and the single cells probably can't. So the single cells, like those ones there, are not going to be able to chemotax because they're not going to be able to see a gradient. Um, and the lower graph that I've shown here shows the derivative, how steep the gradient is that the cells are seeing. And it exactly agrees with that. Those cells down at the bottom they're not seeing any gradient at all, so they can't chemotax. Whereas those clumps are seeing a really big, sharp gradient because they're breaking down so much attractant. So the clumps are making themselves a huge, local, dynamic, self-generated gradient. Um, and we reasoned, we'd explained two things. We reasoned, we explained why the clumps are able to read gradients better than single cells, because it's a self-generated gradient. And we reasoned that the single cells would probably be influenced by the clumps, and the clumps were breaking down the attractant, uh, and they would probably be making reverse gradients in their wakes. Um, and if you look at a movie of all of this, you see that to a degree it's true. There are the clumps, and this, uh, the colors in this movie are again showing you the steepness of the gradient. I'll show that again before I say but. So you see the big clumps make a great big steep gradient in their front halves. And actually some of them manage to make a backward gradient shown in red at their backs. But the big steep front gradient is much steeper than the back gradient. Um, but the little cells, especially at the front there in the high concentrations, can't. Now here was the problem. We could not make our simulations explain why cells would go backwards enough. So we didn't send off our letter saying we'd solved everything. And we went off. And the result has been about three years more simulations 
uh, and trying to understand how cells can go backwards in a coma attracted to the gradient. Uh, and I think we have a fairly good understanding of it now, and that's what I'm going to tell you in the last few minutes of this talk. Firstly, let me tell you why it's difficult. Eukaryotes, which is what we study, have thousands of different receptors. So getting negative information out of a eukaryotic receptor is really tricky. You can't have a thousand people giving you negative information. It would kill you. E. coli, by comparison, which does use negative chemotaxis, only has five receptors. There are exactly five receptors and no more. So it's possible for each of those receptors to say, actually, the amount of chemoattractants going down, I think you ought to turn around. Eukaryotes can't do that. Thousands of receptors don't allow you, to, you'd have too much chatter. Secondly, most eukaryotic receptors act positively. G protein coupled receptors in particular, when they're bound to a ligand, they can send a signal to a G protein and that can cause a change in the cell. When they're not bound to a G protein, not bound to a ligand, sorry, they don't send a signal to the G protein. They don't send a negative signal saying actually, where unoccupied receptors, uh, we think you should do something about it. So they're only acting positively. And again, that makes it much harder to work out how you would get a mechanism that gave you positive chemotaxis. So instead, we made a different hypothesis. We made a hypothesis that negative chemotaxis uh, was actually caused by not things binding to receptors and activating them, um, uh, but molecules binding to positive chemoattractant receptors uh, and competitively inhibiting them. Let me explain myself a bit. Chemotaxis only works through your receptors, right? Um, uh, you have cell surface receptors that couple to G proteins, and that is all the cell sees whether the receptors are active or not. So the receptors act positively. When they're bound to a ligand, they're active and they talk to things downstream. When they're not bound to a ligand, they ignore other receptors. Chemotaxis only detects gradients. So if a cell detects more active receptors to its front and fewer active receptors at its back, uh, then it'll go forwards. Uh, if it detects more active receptors at the back, then it'll turn around. So the secret of chemotaxis is looking at gradients of activated receptors. Um, if you look at a graph, if you give cells chemoattractant uh, chemo looking like this, low to the left, that axis there is distance, low to the left, high to the right, you get a gradient of active receptors, which is related to the gradient of attractant, but not the same. And the cells will always ride upwards on that gradient. So, what we think is going on when cells do negative chemotaxis is that molecules bind to positively acting chemotactic receptors and inhibit them without activating them. So if you have a gradient of inhibitor like that, it doesn't do anything. It binds to the receptors and it doesn't activate them. So there's no gradient and the cells don't go anywhere. That's what we expect. But if there is some attractant around, either because you've put it there or because the cells have made it and self-stimulated, you have some chemoattractant. You have that gradient of inhibitor. And there on the left, there's enough attractant to activate half of the receptors. There's still enough attractant to activate half of the receptors but it's got a competitor up there. So less than half of the receptors will be occupied. So the gradient of active receptors will go backwards and the cells will go backwards, reverse chemotaxis at the gradient of inhibitor. So here's the question, can that happen in real life? Um, equations and graphs and uh, uh, pretty pictures are very nice, but what happens if you take a chamber? Um, so here is a chamber, and I put a little bit of an undegradable chemoattractant. When I say I, obviously Adam did the work here. Um, we put a little bit of chemoattractant in the left, and we put a little bit of chemoattractant to the right, and so the gradient between them is flat. And you can see all of those cells, they're very happy 
a little bit of chemokinesis. They move a little bit faster because there's an attractant there, but they're not going anywhere. Now, instead of that, we're going to look at what happens if we give them a gradient of an inhibitor. And the inhibitor is zero at the left of this chamber, and the inhibitor is high at the right of this chamber, and the cells don't much care for the inhibitor, um, but they're not going away from it. There's no migration. There's just stasis. But when you mix those two things together, the cells fly away from the high concentration of inhibitor. <clears throat> so the model I showed you earlier is not only right, but it's absolutely radically right. It's extraordinary how clear this chemotaxis assay is. It's a beautiful movie. So this is a slightly artificial situation that we've built here with undegradable chemoattractants and combinations of things. Can I explain a real situation where chemo repulsion happens? Well, here is another one. Oh, let's get to a, another one first, another question first. If this negative chemotaxis, if this cell's going down the gradient of the inhibitor, or is it actually positive chemotaxis? It's a totally semantic difference, um, but I reiterate, chemotaxis goes in the direction of the activated receptors, uh, even if that's the opposite of the direction of the molecule. So here's a case of chemorepulsion. Um, this is a molecule called 8-CPT cyclic AMP, which is a well-known chemorepellent from Dictyostelium. <clears throat> and we've got a micropipette there containing it, and the cells they're not terribly convinced. They migrate a bit. Um, you can see particularly the ones around the edge of the frame are tending to move away. But now if we're going to put a background of a positive acting uh, chemoattractant there, we suddenly found it's turned into a very good chemorepellent indeed. The cells absolutely fly away from the um, needle. Let's show that one more time. Takes them a little bit of thinking. Ah, it's interesting. There's the movie of repulsion. Off they all go, extremely directed, uh, well away from the um, well away from the micro um, And if you're going to do some graphs, um, there are some cells responding to a um, micro pipette with just the repellent in them, and you see they're a little bit repelled. The top half of that graph on the bottom is positive chemotaxis, and the bottom half is negative chemotaxis. If we put caffeine into this to stop the cells stimulating themselves, so there's no background of a positive signal at all, uh, now the cells aren't repelled at all by the HCPT. But when you put in a background of an attractant, suddenly they fly away from the needle uh, in the most directed way you could imagine. It really does look as if they're trying desperately to escape from that needle. So our conclusion is that the known chemorepellent, HCPT cyclic AMP, is not really a chemorepellent. It needs to be interacting with a positive attractant like cyclic AMP to work. It's an inhibitor of cyclic AMP, and chemorepulsion is by um, an interaction with the positive agent. And it turns out that all the things I showed you in the first half of this talk are true here too. So cells can shape gradients. If they have a degradable gradient, they can break that and make better chemotaxis. You can have two positive gradients where the dashed line is the gradient of um, uh, inhibitor and the straight line is the gradient of the activating one. And that still gives you negative chemotaxis. I'm a bit short of time. So I'm going to run through this really fast. But the left-hand side is showing you the model, and the right-hand side is showing you real cells. And even though both gradients are higher off to the right, the cells are migrating brilliantly to the left. And here you start seeing the beauty of it, because if you start interacting a degradable chemoattractant with a not degradable inhibitor, then there on the left, 
the degradable attractant can get shaped into a really steep gradient. It's there on the right, sorry. There on the left, um, most of the degradable attractant is broken down. So you're going to get complicated results. And what happens, sorry, I hit the wrong button. What happens if the cells on the right came attacks to the right, and the cells came attacks on the left, the cells on the left came attacks to the left. So the cells on the left are doing negative chemotaxis, and the cells on the right are doing positive chemotaxis. Cooler still, if you have a gradient of degradable chemorepellent and a gradient of not degradable chemoattractant, then the gradient of repellent there becomes steep, so the cells get told to go that way, and the gradient there of attractant remains steeper, and the degradable repellent becomes shallower, so the cells get shown to go that way. And again, you get this complicated emergent behavior happening from a really simple setup. Isn't that fantastic? And then most counterintuitive at all, um, if you have a repellent that's not a very good repellent, it's just a bit attractive, then you get an insanely complicated, insanely counterintuitive situation where you have two positive gradients, each of which will send the cells to the right. But when you mix them, it's a repellent gradient. Um, there are graphs um, showing uh, two attractants, RP camps and SP camps. Uh, and on their own, um, cells are always in the top half of the graph. So they're always being sent to the right positive chemotaxis. But when you mix them together, instead of being on the top half, this curve is in the bottom half. So the cells are being sent backwards. Not a strong effect. Oh, that was a model. Uh, and the real cells follow the model very nicely. So it's a little bit more complex, a little bit harder to sell. A little bit harder to see, sorry, um, but I would like you to fixate on these cells on the left and you'll see what I'm saying is true. Here are cells with a gradient of SP camps and the cells are chemotaxing rightwards. They're chemotaxing onto the bridge. Here is a gradient of RP camps and the cells are chemotaxing rightwards. It's positive chemotaxis towards the high part of the gradient. And then if you mix those two identical gradients together, they're all going the other way. And I think that's a wonderful place to end this talk um, because it's illustrating all the conclusions I'd like to make. The conclusions go like this. Oh, that movie didn't work, that's a pity. Never mind. The conclusions go like this. Firstly, enjoy complexity. Um, complexity um, is really interesting. Complexity is why we are biologists. Um, it's good to have a simple system so you understand things, but don't let trying to make things simple fool you into thinking complexity is wrong. Complexity is interesting and wonderful and we should study it and embrace it. Second conclusion, um, when you have complicated things like this, you're probably going to have to use some maths and some modeling. You're certainly going to have to do some good experiments. Um, uh, but intuition starts breaking down. And what you need to do is join maths and join models uh, and join them together. And then you can find reality. Uh, and it's wonderful. <clears throat> and the third conclusion um, is a general one about this one in cell movement, which is um, uh, what you've seen here is lots of biology self-generated gradients and interacting gradients of attractant. They're everywhere in biology and they're marvelous. Um, this movie should have ended up showing you cells going through the Hampton Court maze, but it didn't. So I'll just leave you finally with a picture of a couple of mathematicians, one mathematician and a physicist doing a biological experiment just to show you that it's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. That was really fantastic. If everyone wants to unmute and give a real applause. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Thank you all, and thank you those who have contributed work too, because I talked about some of your work. I can see you on here. All right, so we'll, uh, I'll ask, we've got loads of questions. I'll try and mention which ones are from the first half about the mazes and which are from the reverse, but I'll, I'll just start from the beginning. So question from Cedric Plutoni, have you uh, tried to implement contact inhibition of locomotion in your in silico and working model? Yes, of course we have, yes. And it's, the, the results are very, very interesting. So um, uh, when you put contact inhibition in silico in the model, um, in some ways it looks similar, the cells fly away from one another. In some ways it absolutely doesn't. So the waves that I kept showing you can't happen in a contact inhibition model. Instead, you get a few cells at the front breaking off and anywhere where the cells wanted to form a wave, they couldn't. So a wave of cells migrating is diagnostic for self-generated hemataxis. Um, and in quite a lot of situations in real biology, you will of course have both contact inhibition and self-generated hemataxis and a whole load of other stuff going on as well. Um, but yes, um, modeling is a very good way of telling the difference between those two interesting processes. Okay, and we've got a question from Georgia Skeeter. So uh, a corollary of this model is that the steepness of the gradient should strictly be dependent on the number of cells or the density. In other words, is this an emotion phenomenon of a collective or do individual cells still be able to generate their own local gradient? Yeah, very, that's, that's a, a marvelous question. Thank you. Um, um, it's even more emergent than that, um, actually. So we find when we are modeling that there are circumstances where single cells can make their own gradient. Um, we've not been able to repeat that in experiments because it needs a fairly low diffusion regime. And most of our experiments don't allow us to get that lower diffusion. Um, uh, but um, we do find quite a lot of similar emergent properties. Like in all those mazes, um, there is a fixed number of cells likes to go up the path. And if you change the concentration of attractant, um, then the number of cells that's in that group of cells going up the path changes. And it's sort of obvious when you say it now, but it actually quite surprised us when we, uh, when we did it all. And that emergent behavior means an awful lot of the sorts of tests we'd like to do don't work because the cells change and um, uh, uh, adjust the environment to suit what they want to respond to. Jen, you have a question from YouTube? Yeah, uh, from YouTube, we have somebody wondering how long does it take the cells to make the gradient? So can you tell oh, us a little bit question. about timing? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, thank you. The online questions are excellent. Um, for dictyostelium cells, they have crap loads of a cell surface enzyme uh, and they can break down a colossal quantity of chemoattractant. In other systems, um, they're less well adapted to it. The melanoma cells, um, they can break down quite a lot. They have a cell surface enzyme called LPP3, which breaks down quite a lot. Um, other systems that do self-generated gradients, for example, the lateral line primordium in zebrafish use um, decoy receptors. And decoy receptors are much slower at removing stuff, so they take much longer. But it turns out we knew all along, we knew long before we knew about self-generated gradients, um, that there was a sort of ideal time that the cells took to get over it. We knew in our melanoma chemotaxis experiments um, that the best time to look was between 12 and 18 hours. And we'd always thought it was because we were serum styling the cells. But actually, it turns out it's not. It's because it takes the cells 12 hours to make the gradient. And if you gave them less stuff in the gradient, then the sweet spot turned into being about six hours. And if you gave them more serum, then the sweet spot turned to be 24 hours. Um, uh, and all these things are just really as you would predict from models, so long as you're predicting the right thing. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. So Amanda asks, what happens if the leader cells die? Do the cells behind them replace? Yes. And then Marco asked, um, what if the chemotractin has an intrinsic decaying gradient? Oh, yes. Yes. So um, uh, attractants that decay um, uh, allow the wave to die out. It doesn't make much difference, um, uh, but the wave dies out. The thing that's really interesting is the inverse of that, which is what happens if the environment is full of things that are slowly making a bit more chemo attractive. 
Uh, and if that happens, you get interesting things like instead of the blind ends being denuded, if all the cells go away from the blind ends, then the blind ends slowly become attractive again. So the cells go back and have a quick look in the blind ends every now and then before saying, oh, there's nothing here and going, going back. <clears throat> um, but every different question like that, when you plug it into a model and have a look, um, shows you another new biological behavior that you knew described and that you might have made a really complicated um, conceptual explanation to do. And it turns out that the complexity is probably in the emergent mathematics rather than in the um, number of rules in the system. Yeah, good one. Dan, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, how do, or do the individual cells at the front of the self-generated gradient, do they always stay at the front? Or do some that are sort of just behind then shoulder oh, their yeah. way up to the yeah. front at the expense of others? Uh, Dave Knesch did a sabbatical um, in my group and we loved having him there. And Dave, um, took lots of movies of this. And you could actually sometimes see two cells at the front having a fight. And um, at some point, one cell would get ahead of the other far enough that it could break down all the chemo attractant. <clears throat> and at that point, the cell behind no longer has a steer. So it no longer directs itself up the gradient. So it gets left behind. Um, so if a cell is far enough forward that it's in the gradient, it can get a steer and they all bustle it. But the moment a cell is a little bit behind that and gets no steer, it will never get a steer again. That also answers a question um, from before about what happens if the front cell dies, which is yes, if a front cell dies, then <clears throat> it stops moving. And if it stops moving, the gradient doesn't stop moving. So other cells will be attracted to the stuff that's no longer being broken down. Um, and other cells will replace the other cells at the front. So again, you haven't astoundingly robust mechanism to maintain a, a wave with a fixed number of cells. Uh, a couple of questions, similar questions from Malika and Alexander. So it's a question about the cells that are left behind. So uh, with a self-generated gradient, it seems like many trailing cells are left behind with no directional information. So what are the fate of these cells? Well, they just, they, they, uh, they just sit behind and are left behind. Um, but you see, one of the models I showed you um, with the, uh, the melanoblasts. And you want melanoblasts to be left behind. Um, the melanoblasts migrate from the neural crest round through the dermis, um, and they populate your skin. And um, if um, some of them weren't left behind, then you'd end up with a white spot in the middle of your back. Um, and in fact, quite a lot of diseases where uh, people are born with white spots, turn out to be because of incorrect melanoblast migration. So uh, Muhammad's asking about how general we can assume this behavior is. Is it really cell type specific or has to do with the origin of the cells? Yeah, yes. I think, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm biased, obviously. I, I, I love this. Um, but I think it's really, really universal. But the reason I think it's really universal is, of course, one of my interests in all of this has been, um, do cells tend to have systems that would break down chemoattractants? Um, and it turns out that almost every cell that chemotaxes also has lots of ways of getting rid of chemoattractants. And we have traditionally always looked in this in a sort of static thing, it's getting rid of the chemoattractant. Uh, uh, but it could also be just as much that it's trying to maintain um, uh, self-generated gradients and such like. Just to give you an example, um, quite a lot of uh, immune cells have an enzyme called DPP4, and it's a, a cell surface outward facing enzyme. And DPP4 specifically breaks down a whole load of chemokines. All chemokines that have a proline of their second amino acid um, uh, will tend to be broken down by DPP4. Um, and that accounts for about half of all chemotactic uh, chemokines. Um, so um, uh, all of the lipids that are chemoattractant have a family of cell surface enzymes that break them down, LPP1, LPP2, LPP3. Um, uh, and then you have a whole um, family of uh, things like ADAM proteases, which are proteases on the cell surface, which will break down protein signals. So I think it's probably more or less, more or less universal. 
Um, so what do you think the physical and mechanical environment plays in affecting the chemotaxis? Yeah, yeah, well, everything. So um, we, um, we love in, in our, uh, Laura Macheski and I have uh, combined sometimes groups here. And, and Laura is very interested in mechanical signaling and mechanical environments. <clears throat> My view of how they interact is probably that mechanical in environments do two things. Firstly, they change the way cells move, but also they change the way chemoattractants diffuse. And of course, flow will replace chemoattractants. None of our um, models that I've shown here uh, have got a flow component, uh, but if your chemoattractant is coming from blood, then uh, uh, it's, it's being replaced thus as well. But the um, uh, environment um, brings you um, <clears throat> ways for things to flow as well. Here's a nice example of this. Glioblastoma is another horrible spready tumor, uh, and it tends to spread down things like um, nerve sheaths. And the traditional explanation has been that th those are just the easiest way for it to go. But I would point out that if there was a diffusing self-generated chemoattractants gradient with steering glioblastoma, then that would also tend to steer the cells down the uh, nerve sheaths as well, because that is the best source of chemoattractant that will be replenished the fastest. So that will give you the steepest gradient. So we've got a question here from Heiner who wants to know whether or not the cells at the front differ mm -hmm. molecularly from the cells that are left behind and what's really happening to those cells, for example, in the yeah. mouse limb data that you showed. Yeah. Hello, Heiner, I haven't seen you for years and years. Very nice to see you online. Um, so um, there is no need for the cells at the front to be molecularly different. <clears throat> in our models, which do a really good job of recapitulating the biology we see, um, the cells tend to be identical, but if you go ahead and do it differently, and if you go ahead and um, model um, uh, a diverse population of cells with different receptors densities or different densities of the enzymes that break things down, then you slowly select for ones with more receptors and faster breakdown at the front of the wave. And sometimes you get interesting emergent things like blobs of cells of a, of, of a particular uh, genotype. Um, uh, more often, however, you just get a sort of slow um, uh, sifting. Um, so if you're in a real mouse embryo, <clears throat> what you would tend to see um, is that the faster moving and more responsive cells tend to get to the front. But if for some reason they don't, or they differentiate, or someone eats them, um, then the other cells before will fill up the gap. Um. We have a question from Timothy about what parameters do you think of this chemotaxis might be preserved in haptotaxis? Ah, yes. So haptotaxis, to explain for anyone, there, there are presumably some people who don't know, um, is um, when the uh, molecule is not diffusing, when the, uh, key, the attractant is something that is a bound chemoattractant. Um, there, there's sort of hard haptotaxis where the, uh, where the cells are feeling the subtrapan, and there's soft haptotaxis, where it's just like chemotaxis, but the attractant is bound. So the soft one, where the cells are just using their receptors the normal way, we just think is exactly the same, only with a very low diffusion coefficient. So all we need to do is go through all of our models and turn down the diffusion until it's zero or near enough zero, uh, and you get exactly the, exactly the same result. Um, what happens when you get a very low diffusion coefficient is that the exploring of space works very, very well, but the exploring of blind ends doesn't work at all anymore. If you're not getting any diffusion, then the attractant can't diffuse out of the blind ends, so you can't see into them um, without, uh, without visiting them. But the spreading out behavior still stays exactly the same. Sorry, one more, just, um, this, we're gonna do the last question because we're going over time. Um, okay. Just, I'm trying to choose. Uh, what, <laughs> <laughs> what should be the last one? Oh goodness, now it's all this pressure. Adam, did you have a favorite? I, I'm um, on the email if you want me. Yeah, oh, actually, yes, sure. um, yes. 
Well, I think that brings us that brings us to the point that we're hoping to continue these discussions on the Slack channel that we created. So we'll send that link out to, to everybody. Um, and, and it will Rob, also be posted in the Zoom chat and YouTube live chat by one of us as soon as we've done talking. Um, so, so uh, one from Tim, he says the model predicts that the leading cells have breadcrumbs of trailing cells at some rate. These cells seem undirected, whereas in the biology over time, it seems like the trailing cells eventually make it. So how do the trailing cells find their way? Okay. So an earlier question exactly hit that nail on the head. So in the models that I showed you, especially the earlier models I showed you, there's no replenishment of the chemoattractant. So once the cells have broken down the chemoattractant, it's not there anymore. Um, so in a situation like that, which is the same as a model where we have a chemotaxis chamber or a slab of agar or so forth, when the cells have broken down the attractant, it's gone. In a model like that, cells constantly get left behind as breadcrumbs, as you said, and there's no signal left for them to come back. But in quite a lot of real life scenarios, there will be production of the chemoattractant, biological production of it. Uh, and if the biological production of it is over there, then eventually the other cells uh, the attractant will build up again and the other cells will go over there. If the um, production is global and there's a low level production everywhere, then what will happen is the breadcrumb cells will get as far away from one another as they possibly can, because anytime they get to get close to one another, there's less chemo attracted between them and more on the other side. So you get a thing where they kind of, you get social distancing. Um, yeah, that's a very good way of ending the ending this particular discussion, isn't it? So background production turns the breadcrumbs into socially distant breadcrumbs, whereas production at a source somewhere else eventually rescues other people. Um, or you can have neither. So what's presumably happening in the in the um, pigment in the skin is that there is only a window of about a couple of days where the cells are allowed to move, and after that they differentiate. And when they differentiate, they move up into the epidermis of the hair follicles, and they can't move anymore. Um, so uh, in that case, they're not breadcrumbs. They're your skin, and they're why your skin's um, pigmented evenly in the way it is. Perfect. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you all that very much indeed. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Yes. So just before anyone goes, uh, Slack is now being posted in the Zoom and YouTube chat so you're welcome to join us over there if you want post seminar discussion on anything um, and we'll be sending an email out for next week's talk which will be professor sally horn from university of chicago so we hope to see you all next week oh, okay. and we had a peak of this week i think we had 400 viewers at one point robert during most of that seminar so excellent good attendance so thank you everyone and we'll see you all next week thank you all see you soon bye Bye. Great you. talk, Robert. Say Thank hi to you. Laura. I will, I will. Okay. Bye-bye. Terrific talk. Thank talk. you. Robert, this is Giorgio. Oh, hello, Giorgio. <laughs> Thank you for your cells and your help. Um, you were a part of this. Thank you. 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 Yes, yes, yes. That would be super cool. <laughs> All right. Take, take care. Say, say hello to Laura. I will.